Hello, my name is Michaela O'Connor Abrams, founder of Mocha Plus. Welcome to our Collective Conscience series. We created this series for you to bring together great minds from around the world on myriad topics that we hope will expand your mind, will challenge your current beliefs, and give you an opportunity to be inspired with every video. Enjoy. All right. Hello, everyone. And welcome to Collective Conscience Salon. This is our first in 2021. And while it's a little bit later than we planned, um, could not be more thrilled to begin our 2021 series with this new book and the stars of the book, really. My friend, the author Kim Cross and Bruce Stahl, of yes, that's right. That's why he has that last name, the famous Dollhouse case study number 22. So um, I have muted you all upon entry, but I want very much for you to be able to participate in this. So what I will ask is that if you have a question, you don't have to wait to ask it, put it into chat. Sophie, my incredibly capable project manager here, which on, um, gallery view, you should see as Sophie Richards. Um, and she is also going to be monitoring chat. So we will look at the questions. If you'd like to ask it yourself, then I will happily or Sophie will unmute you. So you may ask Bruce or Kim or both um, the question that you have for the evening. So welcome. We're missing a few people. I've been getting um, texts that they're going to be a little late, but in the interest of uh, starting on time or close to uh, on time, uh, I thought we would begin. So as you, I hope, already know, my name is Michaela O'Connor Abrams. I am the founder of Mocha Plus and Collective Conscience is one of our really important um, brand foundations of Mocha Plus. We began this during the pandemic, actually January, before we had really been told to lock down in as an in-person salon with the wonderful Nancy Davis Co. And then when we were locked down, we went to 40 straight weeks of collective conscience with speakers from around the world. And it's all on YouTube. If you go to Mocha Plus, you will see uh, all 40 hours. So tonight, as I said, we have the author of case study number 22, The Making of a Modernist Icon, and one critically important person who grew up in that house, Bruce Stahl. And what we're going to do this evening is take a look at the book, which comes out this summer, by the way. Um, and in my opinion, talk about the most significant part of this house, and that's the life lived in it, right? Those of you who are architects, and I see there are a few of you that I know that are on, and those of you who just love architecture and design, and maybe for whom it is your avocation, I think you know that architecture begins when people live in it, right? When it is experienced and comes to life. So we're going to hear about case study 22, the Stahl House tonight through the eyes of Bruce Stahl and our author of the new book, Kim Cross. So Bruce and Kim, welcome. I am so, so honored to have you both as our first guest of Collective Conscience 2021. And I might add a preamble to our stage debut at the Palm Springs Art Museum on May 24th, where you will be on stage and having an even deeper in-depth discussion. All of you on this um, Zoom call on Collective Conscience tonight are invited to that incredible event, which in person, properly distance, you will be able to meet Kim and Bruce and Bruce's sister, Sherry, uh, and see the model that we're gonna talk about tonight. So. Anyway, I, uh, without further ado, welcome. And Bruce, let's just dig right in. Mm -hmm. um, this home is famous 
around the world, right? And yet this was your childhood home. And so I think I'd love to give everybody the first glance idea about your parents, because most people, of course, know that it is the stall house, but they may not even know the names Buck and Carlotta. So bring them to life for us and tell us how this all got going. Well, um, dad moved out from St. Louis, Missouri. Couldn't stand the place, said it was cold in the winter and hot and sticky during the summer. And when he got out to California, lived out here for a while, did a little bit of modeling. Um, he also got into the aerospace industry as a purchasing agent. And one of his calls took him to, um, Kim, refresh my memory, was it North American Aviation? I believe so. Yeah, where, where my mother was a receptionist. And at first sight, they kind of bonded and that was the beginning of this dream they set out on. And uh, they actually shortly, they quartered at uh, the flight deck uh, in, in, in LAX. They went dancing with the big band era. And um, at first my grandfather was, uh, was a little upset. This was my mom's dad because my father was 17 years older than my mom. But after seeing the love that he really showed for her, um, and they came to like him very much. And uh, once they were uh, married, they rented a flat up on a road called Hillside, which is across the canyon from this chunk of dirt that they fell in love with. And for probably, I don't know how long, but they, they would stand out on their patio and they could view this, these lots being cut up on the hillside. And one day uh, my mom says, let's go, let's go visit our lot. Now, mind you, they hadn't even been there yet and they had already started calling it their own. So they took a drive one day and uh, ended up on this lot, parked on it, looking at this unbelievable 270 degree view of the city. Now, mind you, the city wasn't very tall back then. City Hall was the biggest building in LA. You can barely see it now with all the high rises. But uh, after about, you know, a bit of time had passed, they heard this road coming up this gravel road. And it was a gentleman uh, that was driving up from La Jolla. His name was uh, George Bia. He was the owner of the lot that they fell in love with and also the one next to it. After about an hour, they negotiated a price. My dad gave him a hundred bucks, shook on it, and they bought a lot for $13,500. <laughs> now, the guy wanted to sell him both pieces of property for $25,000, but that was way too much for my parents to, to afford. Now, mind you, you could have bought a house and a lot for 13.5 back in 1954. And that was the beginning of the dream. Now they spent, they didn't start building right away. They spent probably about three to four years paying the lot off and grading and, and basically squaring up the corners of the lot so they could build. And that was the start of it. Now I could tell you the whole story, but <laughs> I don't it's know how pretty... far you, I don't know how far you want me to go with it, but uh, well, it... yeah, I mean, I want to just jump in a little bit because I I see as we're growing here in numbers, um, the one thing I neglected to do is to ask everybody. You don't have to actually use the emoji on your computer to do the hand raise. You can literally just raise your hand. How many people know what the case study program? was and is and why this is the Stallhouse case study number 22. Good, good. And we have people who don't. And so briefly, because we could do an entire salon on the case study program, and some people have suggested that we should do that. <clears throat> but that is not tonight. Tonight is just number 22. But briefly, please know <clears throat> that Arts and Architecture Magazine and their editor-in-chief, John Intenza, launched this program to 
This is post the war when we've got tens of thousands of service men and women and partners and spouses coming back and knowing that we needed housing and launched this program and competition so that there could be really well-designed homes for the masses, right? So number 22 is, um, I think, the most famous because of its own journey. Um, and as someone who uh, spent one year in the Schindler King's Roadhouse in Hollywood, um, I know how exciting that was. I can't even imagine getting to grow up in, in 22. So I, I hope that helps for those of you to give a context to case study. Um, and if you hadn't had a chance to look it up, but it was an incredibly important program, went on for years longer than the editor thought it would in order to get these homes built and show the world what modern, meaning the philosophy of the way we live, not just the aesthetics, but really the philosophy of good design and what that looked like. So Bruce, mm -hmm. back to this and this, and your parents, by the way, one of the things that each of you are going to see when you um, get this book this summer is that Buck and Carlotta, um, Bruce's parents were an unbelievably gorgeous Hollywood couple. I mean, photogenic, telegenic, really unbelievable. And yet through all the photographs taken by the famous Julia Schulman and many others, they're not shown in most of those photographs. There is a kind of a stand-in model couple. And that was one of the things I said to Kim Bruce, how did that happen? Because your parents were absolutely just this, I mean, quintessential Hollywood couple. Really unbelievable. And your mom, as it, by her own words, thought she was showing this house to at least a thousand people a month. <laughs> so well, mom, mom actually was, I think, the in, ambassador for mid-century modern because she was willing to open that door to anybody that was willing to walk up the hill. My dad, he just wanted to be left alone most of the time, but he he loved showing it off in his own way. But, but mom if anybody knocked on the door, she was, they invited them in, you got a Coke and you, and you got the tour. And nice. that started early on. And my sister today and, and I today still try to hold that same uh, passion. Cause what we do is we have tours now. Um, we charge a nominal fee to help keep um, the place going. And also to keep some structure to uh, the house, because if we just let the doors open anytime anybody wanted to come up, it would be chaotic up there. You have no idea, because people come up unannounced all the time uh, wanting to see the house. So uh, God bless the next person that ever wants the house. They're gonna be bothered all day. <laughs> I do, okay. I, I do have a, a, a wedding picture of my mom and dad. If you, if you give me a moment, I'll grab it. If you want to take a, take a look at them. Okay. Hang well, on just a moment. Excellent. All right. Well, while Bruce is doing that, Kim, you know, finding them or they finding you mm -hmm. to write this story and bring this to life for the first time. I know of no other book. I've actually asked this of one of our, um, participants here, George Smart. Is there another book about the lifestyle, what it meant to grow up in, the, in a case study home? And I don't believe any book is like the making of modernist icons. So that had to have been pretty exciting to take that journey because you and I met, I dare say 20 years ago at Business 2.0. So for you to go from there and find me again, it's like architecture and here we right. are. So that must have been pretty extraordinary. Um, it was, you know, it's, it's funny because <laughs> like my first book, which was about tornadoes, when I started writing that, I knew nothing about tornadoes. Um, this book, I'm not an architect. I'm not a, an, an, a historian. I'm, I'm just a great storyteller and a great reporter. And so when they came to me, I, I had never heard of the house. I had never heard of the case study house program, but I dug in and started reading widely. And to my knowledge, there isn't another book about this one house. Um, this house is in every book about the case study house program and it's on the cover of a lot of them. But um, when I got to know Bruce and Sherry, I realized how little of the family story is really out there. There are tidbits here and there, but 
in Arts and Architecture magazine where the house made its debut and why part of the reason why it exists. There isn't a single picture of Bacca Carlotta in that magazine ever. And it's astounding because they, they were so Hollywood beautiful. They were so attractive. And um, what I love about this book is it's really, uh, Bruce, I'm stealing your line, Bruce, but um, he said it so well. This is sort of the, um, about a blue collar couple with a white collar dream house. And I think when people look at the stall house, they would, they would never guess that in a million years. And so it's this um, story about a couple that had a, a, really, a really bold and uncanny dream. And, and it was really, really hard to, to bring to reality, but um, stars kind of aligned in such a way that it made it possible. And then this, you know, it, it's really like the biography of a house. If the, there's a main character in this book, it's the house. And it goes from being this, this dream, this really hard to build thing into being, you know, just a home. Uh, and then at some point it becomes this architectural icon and then it evolves into a downright celebrity. And today, you know, I dare say it's such a celebrity. It needs its own handler. It needs its own manager. And that's what Bruce's sister, Sherry, does is she's the full-time manager of the house. So. Excellent. Here's, okay. Here's, here's that picture of, of it. let me see if I could uh, hold this up. Wonderful. I hope if everybody's in speaker view, you'll see it larger than you do in gallery view. Incredible. And I, I should jump in and say they ran off to Vegas to get married and they got married in, um, Bruce, can I tell the story of the dress? Oh yeah, let me, uh, here, take note of the dress. Okay, so see the dress she's wearing? So Carlotta, it was their second marriage for both of them. And um, Buck decided, and Buck was an artist. He was a commercial artist, really, really talented. He decided that a white dress was just a little too demure for his bride. And it had lace that covered up, you know, her neckline. And he cut the, you know, he cut the neckline open and he dyed the lace in black coffee. So it's this really kind of bold, fun dress of dark lace over kind of a white background and they just had a couple of friends in attendance as far as we know and I just love that they ran off to Vegas and got married <laughs> it just seems perfect it, it certainly does so we're, we're back to where your parents were it was their lot it was destined to be their lot and then they know that they're ready to build and a model your father does a model of what he wants to see in in how they will live. Well, what he did when he was preparing the lot, um, he, in, in, in his garage uh, at his house, he started to put together a three-dimensional model of what they wanted because he figured it was gonna be very hard to describe to architects what he wanted. So what he did is he built this three-dimensional model um, it's slightly different than what you see today, but that's because of Pierre and my dad working together on this. The original model still had the L-shaped pattern, but the bedroom wing of the house, which is the, which is the side of the house that faces the road, was going to be curved. It was gonna to curve to match the road because the lot that my mom and dad chose um, was the smallest lot up in this development but it was the only lot that had an unobstructed view with no way for anybody to build in front of them. And the lot also, or the, how, the model also had a inverted butterfly roof and the carport was gonna be between the bedrooms instead of on one end. So you could see how Pierre and my dad worked together. Pierre convinced my dad that the butterfly roof was too costly and bending steel was out of the question. And to order to fit it into the case study program, the idea was to be able to buy off the shelf product, take it to the site, put it together like an erector set. Um, I'm probably aging myself a little bit. That was a toy for kids back when I was a kid. <laughs> there we go. <laughs> um, but Pierre convinced my father to flatten and straighten the house. And then my mom really didn't like the idea of a, of a carport between the bedrooms. So the carport got slid all the way over to the end. Initially, um, Koenig had it as a single car carport, but that got widened to two cars, um, which brought the size of the house down. The house was about 2,300 square feet and you could stand in one spot in the yard and virtually see the whole house. Um, the only part you really don't see is the, 
the service area, back closets, and master bath. So we've jumped right to um, Pierre Coney, right? Who was uh, an architect who was in the case study program. And your father meets Pierre, right? With model and has this discussion about being in the program and getting this house built. What, take us into that chapter in terms of your dad knowing that or not, that Pierre actually would bring this home that he and your mom had dreamed about on this piece of dirt that mm -hmm. they had already known that they were buying. What does that next stage look like? Well, mind you, Pierre was the third architect. The two prior to him turned my parents down, said, we can't build what you want. One, it was all glass. Part of the house was cantilevered and um, they just flat out refused. And um, Pierre saw the plans, but he saw, he saw something there because he described the lot as an eagle's nest. And my dad's model kind of uh, basically um, enhanced this lot. And my parents decided that they spent many times up there figuring out, okay, where do we put the walls to build the house? And they decided they didn't want any walls at all. So hence the, the glass house. But when they met Pierre, they met Pierre through, uh, uh, Kim, refresh my memory, a pictorial, Sunday pictorial section. Were, right, they were flipping through, I think the, um, the newspaper and there was a pictorial living and it featured one of Pierre's homes. And so they took note, and this is after several architects had turned them down. They, they brought them out to the lot. They said, no, this is unbuildable. And they saw his work. And so they reached out to him. And he, I think he was, he was still either in architecture school or just recently graduated. I think it was the latter. And so he was, he was young and he had experimented with steel and building his own house, which he did while he was still a student at the University of Southern California School of Architecture. And he learned from the mistakes or at least when he designed that house, he um, he thought he could get it for a certain price. And when he went to bid, it was it was way too much, much more than he could afford. So he went down to the steel company to the uh, manufacturers of all the different parts. And he said, what am I doing wrong? And so from them, he learned how to design. Um, he realized he had designed a uh, a wooden house with steel parts and he had to redesign it as a steel house with the parts um, you know, off the shelf as they were. So he took that, he was just perfectly equipped I think to, to build this house because he had experimented on his own and learned from it. So then he could take what he had learned from his own house and apply it to the stall house. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I, I describe Pierre and my dad um, as renegades. They, they didn't know what the meaning of no was. They, they thought no just meant find another way. And that's what they did. Sounds familiar. Um, <laughs> I can think of a few people on this um, Zoom tonight who I would say that about. And, and the, the, <laughs> the import of that to me is also that, and Kim, you touched on this, you know, being a, a blue collar family in this, in this dream. And yet, you know, what the case study program was about and what Koenig and so many of the other architects wanted so badly to do was to make sure that all of the innovation of the materials and the building system and the siting of these homes would be there for everyone, that these were not for the elite. And yet I think much to the chagrin, um, I don't know actually if John Intenza had this chagrin, the editor of Arts and, and Architecture Magazine, but many of the architects did report later that um, the homes then were celebrity because they were so forward thinking and because of the materials and the, um, the attention to the design on the site that it, they were then co-opted by the elite. And that's true for dozens of the modern architects. So it's, it's especially important to me, Bruce, that you know we talk about what that life was like because this was not um, an elite story of just this very rare family in the hills getting to do this. They actually brought this together um, with the money that they knew they had on budget, with Pierre knowing that there was a value to understanding the engineering, like you've just said, not a wooden house with some steel, but redoing it in steel and understanding 
what that really meant. So you, how long does it take for Pierre and your dad to come to final agreement on the house and, and start building? Um, I don't know the length of time. Kim, you might know that better. Um, I would have to look at our timeline. We have a, a very, very long timeline. I would say, you know, some, some months. Um, it, it required, you know, changing things to make it more buildable and more affordable. I and think so went back and forth several times. Yeah, I think um, Pierre came on the scene, I think, in 1958 and they broke ground in May of 59. So there was a lot of logistics. Um, getting the project approved by the city was very difficult. My dad would tell you that's why he hired Pierre because he went to battle for us. And there was one line where Pierre just threw a Hail Mary at the very end because they kept on saying no. And if any of you have been to the house and been in the house, the living room was supposed to be another 10 feet further out um, wow. which would have been hanging out over space even more. And they didn't, the city didn't like the size of the windows. They didn't like the cantilever part, uh, but they basically put their foot down on the extra 10 feet. So it got squashed back down a little bit, but um, Pierre's line to the guys down at city hall said, show me in the code book where it says I can't do it. And if it doesn't say I can't do it, I'm doing it. And that's how, this, this project was approved. And they basically, the, one of the uh, people down at the office down there basically said, okay, we'll give you approval on this, but it'll be the last house ever approved for doing something like this. <laughs> and yet, of course, Lautner came along and did the cantilever tennis court that had all these different problems and cracks and issues that the city you know, probably well, said, is there a conspiracy here with cantilevers? Yeah, no, you know, our house is going on 61 now, and it's still standing strong. Been through a lot of earthquakes, a lot of windstorms, um, but still solid. Yeah, amazing. All right, so we're now fast forward. The house is finished, and your family inhabits it like, I mean, it. it's so a movie, as I had the privilege of um, getting to read the book early before uh, it's printed. It's just, I, yeah, it was incredible to, to be able to see this house that I have known and loved for so long through your eyes. And Kim, you've done an amazing job capturing these moments. And I have to say, I'll ask you, Bruce, what your favorite moments were in the house. And I'm so hoping it's my favorite moment of reading about what you were doing, but I won't well, spoil it. <laughs> there's different moments. The Probably the most magical time is Christmas. Um, the Christmas trees always sat in that corner where the Julie's famous girls photo was taken. And it was just magical because the family would convene, the, the adults were drinking, the kids were running around, just chaotic scene. Um, but my my days were filled with swimming in the pool, jumping off the roof. Uh, that was our that was our playground. And it, it was go ahead. I'm sorry. The jumping off the roof part. You just oh, yeah. it, get it right by that. But I just the part where your father's saying, "Okay," he puts a ladder up. So at ages like four and five or five and six, you and your sister climb the ladder to the roof to wow. jump into the pool, which, you know, now people are like, oh my God. Oh. Anytime, anytime you have a roof that overhangs a pool, guess what's gonna happen? <laughs> yes, absolutely. <laughs> Except I can now see, of course, all the signs saying, you know, no allowed, nothing, you know, but yeah. unbelievable. And you, that first jump when your dad says to do that, and I'm loving that part of the book and you guys go into the nine foot, the deep end, which is nine feet deep. Yeah. Yeah. It's it, being you being at the house is one thing, the height and the, the city view. But when you step up on the roof, now you're about 12 feet higher with nothing around you, a view from here to as far as you can see. And it is exhilarating. I mean, my dad was first generation. I'm second generation. My kids are third generation. And we've got grandkids that are jumping off the roof. Not my kids, but my my. Uh, my cousin's grandkids. So we're on our fourth generation of roof jumpers now. 
off the stall house. And uh, it, the, the, the main rule, don't fall off the ladder when you're going up and aim for the drain. That's the deepest point. <laughs> Um, Michaela, I want to jump in and say, Bruce, you know, what's interesting to me that I learned in the writing of this book is that the pool wasn't really part of the original design. How did the pool come about? Ah, well, originally, we got Pierre on board. Uh, we have the plans. We're about ready to build, but we can't secure a loan from the banks. Um, banks thought that lending to homes in the hills was a risk because of slides and there was a lot of horror stories. The technology and engineering wasn't as good as it is today, but they did find one bank that uh, would lend them the money, but they demanded, we'll give you the money, but you have to put in a pool, but you have to find your own funding for the pool. Originally, it was just going to be a yard. In the model, in the picture, uh, and the recreation of the model that we made, it doesn't show a pool, it's just a yard. And I think the pool was in the plan sometime in the distance, but they were forced to put it in basically the same time the house was built. That's how the pool came about. Incredible. And I, I just a, a small note, I mean, you spending so much time and in the book, it talks about day after day when your mom would just bring sandwiches to the end of the pool and you would, <laughs> you and your sister spent a lot of time in the pool as did the cousins and friends and parties. And, and uh, I think that swimming a lot turned into something really important for you. You wanna? Yeah, well, it's, uh, let me back up here a little bit that there's my um, claim to fame in the background there. I, um, I got into swimming and um, in high school and then um, continued on into college and ended up going to the 1980 and 1984 Olympic trials. I made uh, three national teams and set a world record. That's the, the height of my, uh, the, let me just roll it back. The middle one is my world record certificate. The other four are world rankings from 1979 to 1982. I was world ranked in three, or three events. You just that's imagine where, where swimming in the pool took me. I was going to say, just imagine if that had had to be a yard and not a pool. All that would be different. Yeah, I may be running track at this set point. Maybe. You, very <laughs> possibly, very possibly. So, I mean, Bruce, at what point did you or you and Sherry and Mark know that this was a house of this import? Um. I think I was in high school when I started really putting it all together. And before it was just our home. And I joke with people about on tours when I, when I, I'll pop in on tours and talk with the people because I love people's reactions and their feedback. And they go, what was it like growing up here? And I go, well, didn't everybody grow up in a house like this? And I, <laughs> they go, no. <laughs> but in high school, you know, the movie shoots started picking up. And then I started reading more about the history. And over time, the house has just gotten more and more and more popular. Like I tell people when the house was finished being built, it wasn't famous yet. It was just different. That's what was unique about it. It was in this very unique club of case study houses, which um, was trying to inspire everybody to follow in its footsteps. It didn't work out as well as... I think Intenza wanted it to. I don't think any of them really became mass production, but you could see the footprint of modernism on construction today, the floor to ceiling windows. Unfortunately, they're just building mega mansions with floor to ceiling windows instead of pavilion style uh, homes. Um, right. Well, and I mean, to that point, especially in Los Angeles at that point, Point, Bruce, when we are talking about the 60s in general, that's when the huge tract homes that just took yeah. over San Fernando Valley and everything not that far, right, from your home, Miles, um, just didn't learn anything, right? No. They built these just cookie cutter, you got, and at that point, you didn't even get plan A, B, or C. You just got which house and most of them didn't even last to the 80s. So then we end up with thousands, tens of thousands of homes that basically were detritus. And, and it's really um, kind of sad that 
the program was so significant, is still so significant to architecture and, and to architects and understanding what happened. And, and when we think about it, right, we're talking about 80 years ago. Yeah. And um, so my hope always, and it's as I, when I was at Dwell, we did this in 04, we took up a quasi case study program to do a Dwell home with 17 architects providing models, et cetera, hoping to um, once again, inspire people to do something original, but do something that's appropriate for our time. And I think it's not just a, uh, it's not a political statement, it is a point of view, but the mega mansions that are lot line to lot line so that it becomes somehow a symbol of somebody's success um, are, are not the monikers of success for the younger generation, which is, is great. Now, now, if they could just go back to the case study program and look at that and then bring it into this century and appropriate for the technology and the materials we have, um, yeah. then we'll start having a better legacy of architecture, I think. Um, so when you, the, the house really exists right now, it, nobody's living in it because you manage it for everybody to share um, or you're sharing with everybody what this home uh, is and, and yeah. how it inspired um, the, your dad and Pierre. Yeah, the house has taken on a, um, a different role for Sherry and I. We've turned the family home into the family business, but the underlying thing is we, we want as many people to see it as possible. We're not the type of owners to shut the door, go away, I'm, I'm not letting you in. No, I mean, I just, I, I finished my day up there today. And a lot of times I'll leave the door open to see who walks in. And a couple of months ago, a guy named Dane walked in and an Italian basketball guy. Um, no, he was American, but played in the Italian basketball league, six foot, six foot nine walks in. I go, come on in. And he's become a friend. And uh, it, that's, that's the point. It's meant to be seen. It, it'd be a crime not to let people see this place. And that's what Sherry and I are doing with the tours. And the photo, the photo people have been around since smog in 1960, Kim, four? I think it was 1962, 1960 62. or 1962. Yeah, so that, was, that, was the, that was the first movie. Well, we do a lot of fashion, um, not so many full, full length features because they're very invasive to the neighborhood and the house. Um, but we have a photo shoot coming up on Thursday. Can't say the name because then I'm violating. <laughs> they want privacy, but we're, we have a book for Thursday. We have tours on Wednesday and then uh, Saturday and, you know, but what I, we still use the house. I use it more than Sherry because she's you know, logistically, she's not, she lives up in Idaho. I live 30 minutes away from the house. My wife and I spent the weekend up there last weekend, just relaxing in the sun. And so I, I don't live there full time, but I utilize it a lot. And I'm there so often, it feels like I live there. <laughs> well, I, I remember reading an article in the LA Times about you know, kind of the most photographed home and used by Hollywood. I thought I'd share with everybody some of the movies, The First Power, The Marrying Man, Corina Corina, Playing by Heart, Why Do Fools Fall in Love, Galaxy Quest, The 13th Floor, Nurse Betty, Where the Truth Lies and Night of Cups as recently as 2015. So, and I'm sure there are many more um, coming up because it is just this magical um, place. Um, one of the things that I also wanna touch on that I think brings the home to life is um, in 1989, um, LA Mocha, having nothing to do with Mocha Plus, but I think everybody on this call knows that, that I'm not part of the Museum of Contemporary Art. It's my initials. Um, they did um, an exhibition called Blueprints for Modern Living. And um, it was, once again, number 22, the stall house that is built completely to scale as part of this exhibition. But how did that feel, Bruce, that many years 
later to be and, and see this in a museum, right? Where everybody was invited to come and look at the example of modern architecture and more importantly, modern living. What were we, what was happening then and how did people live like that? And why didn't we take more of that forward with architecture and design? Can you talk about how you and Sherry well, were a part of this? I could tell you how I felt walking through it. Um, Kim can go more into detail about uh, the exhibit. Um, walking through it, uh, we walked through the exhibit and you kind of finish up walking through our house. And it, uh, we're in there and I'm walking through and in, I'm inside the house and I could feel, okay, this is not right, but I'm probably the only one that can feel this because I've grown up in this house. So I know basically every square inch. So if there's a wall that's four inches narrower or anything like that, I can tell. But I turned to a lady and my mom and my dad, my brother, uh, my sister and I are all there. And I turned to this lady and I go, I grew up in this place. And she was just, you did? <laughs> and um, it was, I just had to let it out. That was my way of letting out um, my excitement of seeing the house recreated. Um, and it was just an amazing feeling uh, walking through it. Now, mind you, the city lights weren't there like it is at our house. That's hard to recreate, but it, uh, it was, they, they did a wonderful job at it. Um, so you're also, because I think that the story that the book brings to life so beautifully, um, also because why would we waste a medium <laughs> is also going to be a documentary film next year. Yes? Yeah, we, we actually started working on that prior to reaching out to Kim. The Kim, uh, the, the book it actually moved quicker. Um, we're still working on the editing stage of, of the documentary, but it'll be the visual uh, companion to the book. Um, basically telling the same story. Kim, you may want to uh, chime in and, and say a little bit about that because you and Michael uh, collaborated yeah. quite a bit. So I've been um, working closely with the director who it so happens, I love this story, was the best friend of um, Bruce and Sherry's younger brother, Mark. And um, Michael grew up going to spend the night at the stall house. And he, um, so he's known it and known the family very well, but he's super talented. But um, I think the, the documentary will focus um, pretty tightly on the family story. And the book uh, zooms out a little bit more to talk about the history and the, the context of modernism and the case study house program. So they'll be um, not redundant, but kind of a Venn, Venn diagram where they overlap a little bit, but will be companion pieces to telling the story. When to that end, when did the house first open for tours? Well, the very first tour was prior to my family move, even moving in because the house um, arts and architecture, the, the agreement was that they had, I think, four weeks of open house to let the public walk through. So we couldn't even, even though the house was completed, the, we couldn't move in yet. So, and it was all staged and everything like that. And uh, my mom was lamenting because um, it, when Julius took his famous pictures, it was all staged nice with all this nice furniture. And she was hoping that the, the furniture designers would leave it. <laughs> they, were, they were offered it at a reduced price, but by the time the house was done, they were basically house poor. And there were cert certain parts of the house that weren't even completed um, and my dad had to finish them. And uh, if you look at early photos, you'll notice on the four-sided fireplace that there's a sh there's sheetrock up on the upper part of the fireplace. Well, originally in the original plan, it was supposed to be rock, but um, the budget ran out and they had to just put up whatever they could do. And that was one of the first things that was done once we moved in. My dad put extended the rock and put it up on the, on the fireplace. So it's about as close original as possible. And then post living in it as a family for the first number of years, when then do you go back to actually having it formally on tour? Um, well, it was never really, we didn't start the tours until um, I think the, the 2008 turned down in the economy and we opened up our doors for tours to the public in 2009. 
Um, that's when we first did it. But we did tours for MOCA and, and, and certain organizations back then when my mom and dad were still alive. But they usually were just weekend things. And it was organized. And it was basically tours all day long. Uh, groups would come, they would go, and then next group would come and go. But nothing really organized like we have it today. Okay. So um, one of the things I want to say to everyone, if you are interested in touring the house and you're going to be in Los Angeles or you are in Los Angeles, um, would you please um, let us know? Because we would um, love to organize something this summer when the book comes out and there's a celebration and Mocha Plus will work with Bruce and Kim on this. So um, please let us know if that's something that you'd love to do. I, a little biased, but I think that you should make it uh, a priority. It's that extraordinary. Um, I want to go to questions because we've got only about um, 10 minutes left. Am I, let's see. Um, so do I have anything from, no? I don't, no, no, no burning questions. <laughs> I'm shocked. No additions, maybe George Smart or Rick Apretta want to say anything about the house? Hi, this is George. Hey, okay. George. And I wanted to know, uh, what was the role of William Porish, the structural engineer who had to make this whole thing stand up? Um, <laughs> you want to that yeah, please. So we didn't we didn't go into great detail about William, but he was um, uh, a structural engineer who did a lot of work with Koenig, and I believe that Koenig just really trusted him and relied on him to to do that work. I think in contrast, the um, the contractor was was um, didn't have that long standing relationship with Koenig. So I'm sorry. Okay, we don't thank you. A lot more about him. Something I probably know more about. Sorry. <laughs> Hi, this is uh, Rick Capretta. Thank you for a great presentation. Can you hear me okay? Yep. Yes, we can hear okay, you. Okay, great. I have two questions. Are you free to say what this cost per square foot back in the day? Um, I'm not even sure what it costs per square foot. But Kim, did, did we talk about that at all? Yeah, that's a good question. I don't think we did that particular calculation, but we could. We could get back okay. to you on that because I think the total I cost, I don't want to rattle off the top of my head, but I want to say it was in like $35,000 range. And so at 2,300 feet, square feet, you could probably do the, the math. Yeah, the house okay. is about 2,300 square feet. Um, and I think the cost of the house was about what, $36,000? In that ballpark, right. Yeah. Okay, I have a second question. Um, is the, uh, some of these older homes, sometimes maintenance becomes an issue. Are the maintenance costs to keep it up uh, significant or are they manageable? Uh, they're manageable. If you, every, every year um, in December, we usually shut down everything, shoots and uh, tours and we'll, we'll do renovations. Um, this past year, we, we, uh, we painted the eaves under the house. Uh, one year we, um, Recarpeted a um, couple couple three years ago. We did uh, we re um, we refurbished the master bath, and one of our last big projects is going to be the kitchen, taking it back. And our goal is to take everything back to as close to original as possible. That's the goal. Great. And lastly, I'll tell you a quick story. So I went to the USC School of Architecture. Mr. Koenig was my professor in 1977. Mm -hmm. He was very proud of this um, project. And then later in my career, I think when I was about 32 or 33 years old, uh, a partner of mine says, hey, do you know who Julia Shulman is? I said, well, of course I know who Julia Shulman is. is he goes, well, do you want to go up to a studio? And so we went up to a studio and I spent a half a day with them and I ended up buying 25 pieces, which Julia uh, spent the whole day telling me stories about how he was shooting I hope that that afternoon uh, told me uh, told me stories of how he uh, shot all his photographs and the intricacies and little details behind the scenes. But I had seen that photo on your house so many times 
while I was at USC, I decided not to buy it. I bought 25 <laughs> pieces. And as you know, that's one of the most valuable Julius Shulman pieces out there. But I do have a nice collection. Uh, I regret not having your house because it truly is one of the great homes in Los Angeles. So well, there, there's some of those images still floating around out there, I'm sure. Yeah. Yeah. So. <laughs> Yeah. One of the um, questions that was in uh, chat, um, Bruce, is from uh, a friend of mine and someone that I worked with at Dwell when we rented the stall house for oh. our uh, chief um, sponsor of Dwell Design, Kohler. And so Meredith says that she remembers visiting the house during the party and you told her that there was no fence between the pool and the cliff. Is, are, is she remembering that correctly? Well, there was always a fence down the hillside um, for two reasons. Uh, one, to keep people out. And the other reason was to keep us from falling all the way down the cliff. Um, now, mind you, when we were kids, the foliage was, oleanders were almost at deck level. So my sister and I used to play down there. And we just disappear in, into the oleanders and parents knowing that there's a fence down there didn't worry about us. Yeah, that's one of the questions at the tours. They go, how did they raise three kids here? Because it's really only a two bedroom house. You look at it, you go, okay, this is a bachelor pad. Uh, but my dad turned the second bedroom into, the, he divided the room because each the second bedroom has got a closet on each side. Uh, a vanity and a, and a sink on each side. And then behind the wall, there's a common toilet and shower. He split the room down the middle with bunk beds. My sister had one side and my brother and I had the other side. So we shared, my brother and I shared half of a half of a room. And then, um, but they, they made it work. I mean, today's codes wouldn't let you build something like that. One, the glass. Two, you need a fence around the pool. Three, you need a railing around this whole thing but they didn't do any of that. Well, and also I love, because your father thought hallways were an absolute waste of space, there were, <laughs> are none, right? Nope. And so you and your siblings are putting on your life jackets to leave your bedroom, to walk across the, the bridges of the pool in order to get to the kitchen. Yeah, and it was either out the door, over the bridge to the kitchen or through the master bedroom. Uh, because the only way to access this, the second bedroom was through the master. So mom and dad didn't have much privacy probably once we came around, but uh, <laughs> I'm sure they had their moments. But Well, it seems it would be much more fun to don the life vest and go over the pool, right? Yeah. Well, I mean, that was the prerequisite. Until we could swim, um, the life vest went on over the footy pajamas, and we had those on until until we could swim. Once we could swim, then we didn't have to put that on anymore. Then there are the great stories of you and your sister, like jumping on little things to see how fast you could get over the floaties to get to the other side. That, that's I mean, a, this, the story there was my dad, he, he didn't, he grabbed everything he could and scrap pieces of wood to build lampshades. Um, he built a picture chain, a picture frame for my mom, kind of a mid-century look. He built, he, he got a hold of this oversized king size bed that there was no frame for. So he built his own frame. And one day he comes up with these um, plastic cushions that are about this thick, about two to three inches thick. And he comes up with about four of them, enough to go across the pool, but they're in four different pieces. Well, the goal was to run across these foam mats to get to the other side without falling into the pool. <laughs> so sometimes we made it, sometimes we didn't. Sherry made it to as far one time and lost her balance and landed right on her ribs on the side of the pool, which ended the fun for that day. But uh, she'll, she'll probably elaborate on that story a little bit in Palm Springs. <laughs> that is great. <clears throat> well, we are at seven o'clock and which I knew would happen. We, there's so much around this book and the story and Bruce and Kim, I wanna thank you so much for sharing just this, what I hope is something to whet the appetite for each of you so that you will come to Palm Springs May 
23rd, 24th, and enjoy a weekend of architecture at the Palm Springs Art Museum. And Sunday is dedicated to this conversation coming to life on stage and then having a lovely champagne reception in the desert. So think about that. Book coming out date, Kim? August 21st. Um, August 21st. August 31st. 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 Mm -hmm. Okay. And so um, until that time, we will continue to bring the stories forward. We will see anybody who would like to join us in Palm Springs. And then um, please make sure that you email or text me. Those of you who have my phone number, please text me those. I'm Michaela at Mocha Plus sf.com and let me know if you'd like to tour the house this summer and we'll have a, a fun day doing this and listening to more stories if we can get bruce to sit on the edge of that pool and tell us some other fun things that I'd that happened there. But, just give me a call okay well i want to thank you again so so much we're so eager to have this book come out i'm really privileged to have seen it and the amazing photos of your incredibly gorgeous parents and the family as it grew. Really, really special. Thank you and thank you everybody for joining us tonight. Have a wonderful rest of your week and make sure that you see the workshop coming up on um, May 24th with Holly Payne who had been with us last year. I really look forward to seeing you. Thanks again, have a great night. Thank you so much, Michaela. Thank you. Thanks everyone for coming. Bye-bye.